All right, in this lecture we're going to be covering chapters 1 through 3. Chapter 1 is our introduction to law. Uh, in this chapter we're going to define law, explain why we have laws, list various sources of law, distinguish among crimes, torts, and ethics. As defined by Sir William Blackstone and also in Black's Law Dictionary, law is defined as a rule of civil conduct commanding what is right and prohibiting what is wrong. If there is a civil breach of the law, that's normally going to be reflected in some type of damages, either physical, mental injury, or some type of physical uh, damage to property. Business law is law that is concerned primarily with the rules of business transactions. Business law is concerned with what is right or wrong regarding business transactions. The law is also concerned with establishing a framework in which society can operate as smoothly as possible to avoid disputes. Our legal system has its roots uh, primarily uh, in English law, but also in French law. Uh, think about Louisiana and its Napoleonic Code. Uh, and there's also some Spanish influences to our law. Most of our law, however, uh, did come from England when the 13 original colonies were established. We get our common law and concepts of equity or equitable law from English law. The common law, and this is 1-3 if you're following along in your textbook, arises from customs that gradually became law. Colonists brought this concept of law to America from England. Equity law, on the other hand, is a system based on fairness in which money damages sometimes are not sufficient. Two types of relief that equity law provides are restraining orders, also referred to as temporary restraining orders or a TRO, and injunctions. In Mississippi, Chancery Court is where equity law is practiced. Now we derive our law from two sources. The first being constitutions, federal constitution, state constitution, and local constitutions. Usually that's going to be in the form of ordinances. Also the Bill of Rights. The second source of law are federal, state, and local statutes and on the city level, also referred to as the municipal level, we look at ordinances or codes. Now it's the court's job to look at the law and make judicial decisions. When judicial decisions are made, that establishes a precedent, meaning that once a court has decided an issue of law or a question of law, then that precedent is set and stare decisis says that all the other courts are to follow that decision. The higher courts, such as the Mississippi Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, uh, they establish the precedent that the lower courts follow. Uh, administrative agency orders uh, can also make law and decide cases. Administrative law is uh, an entirely different branch of law, but it's one that we come into contact with probably the most often. 1-6 in your textbook 
talks about the difference between civil versus criminal law. Civil law is concerned with private or purely personal rights, whereas criminal law are injuries society as a whole suffers. Uh, two types of crimes are felonies and misdemeanors. The easiest way to distinguish between a felony and a misdemeanor is to look at the punishment. If the punishment carries a year or more in prison, then that is going to be a felony charge. If the maximum penalty is up to one year or less than a year, then that is going to be a misdemeanor. Now there's some laws that can be either felonies or misdemeanors and our textbook defines that type of law as a wobbler or wobblers. Uh, some examples would be shoplifting, DUI. Uh, the first offense is normally going to be a misdemeanor but the third offense is going to be a felony. When we talk about uh, traffic tickets, parking citations, those are violations and infractions, and normally they don't carry any jail time. Uh, it's just going to be some type of monetary fine and or a suspension of some privilege that you have, like uh, a licensing, be it a commercial driver's license or your personal driver's license. 1-7 talks about ethics, changing notions of right and wrong, keep law and ethics evolving. We base our laws on morals. Ethics are those moral principles that help us determine the morality of conduct and motives. 17A discusses the basis for ethical judgment. People have differing backgrounds, so judgments as to what is right and wrong vary based on one's religious beliefs, individual experiences, cultural background, and scientific knowledge. In other words, it's very subjective, so we have to try to create an objective criteria for ethical decisions. Ethical principles, the seriousness of consequences, laws do not reflect everything we believe about right and wrong. Less serious matters are not addressed. So the law establishes a baseline for behavior, uh, but it, that baseline is not what we should strive for. Uh, the baseline in a lot of ways is, is very, very low. Uh, the bar is set pretty low. It's the ethical principles that we should strive for. That's, that's the higher bar that we should always reach for uh, in business and in law. Ethical principles, this is covered in 1-7b in your textbook. It's the consensus of the majority. Laws can't possibly reflect every individual's concept of right and wrong. So uh, we have to go with the consensus of the majority. Change in ethical standards, behavior, behavior evolves as society evolves. So is the bottom line always ethical? That's a question we should always ask ourselves. Uh, oftentimes, a situation may be technically legal, but just because it's legal or lawful doesn't mean it's necessarily ethical. Legally enforceable, codes of professional responsibility for various professions, including realtors, doctors, lawyers, and accountants. So many professions have uh, a written set of ethics or rules of professional conduct and responsibility, and if we violate those, so as a lawyer, if I violate my code of professional responsibility, I can be uh, reported to the bar and disciplined, and that could lead to my legal license, my law license, being revoked. So it's a very serious consequence. In practice, 
the law seeks to make business behavior conform to society standards. In the long run, it is good business uh, to practice in an ethical way. That gets us through uh, our presentation for chapter one. So if you're following along in your textbook and look at chapter two, we're going to continue our discussion of the legal system as a whole uh, by discussing courts and court procedure. So if you look at uh, page 2-1, uh, it discusses the function of courts. Uh, the function of the court system is to interpret law and to apply the law. If a conflict arises between a state statute and a federal statute, the federal statute always takes precedence. Uh, this is referred to as the doctrine of preemption. Federal law always preempts state law. Jurisdiction of the courts, well, in order for a court to hear a case, it has to have jurisdiction over either the people or the subject matter, preferably both. The power or authority of a court to hear cases is its jurisdiction. Courts must have jurisdiction over the subject matter of the case and jurisdiction over the persons involved. Now, 2-2 uh, talks about long-arm statutes. A long-arm statutes are uh, laws that allow a state to have jurisdiction over non-residents. Uh, those statutes usually arise in criminal cases, but if you have a, a civil defendant who's not a resident, uh, there are variations of the long-arm statute that would allow a plaintiff to get that defendant into court. 2-2A discusses venue. Venue is the proper location where a case is to be tried. So it requires choosing the proper court. So if I have a case, uh, that case may be heard in circuit court or maybe it could be heard in chancery court. So both courts would have jurisdiction. It would be the lawyer's job to make sure that the proper venue, which would be either the circuit court or the chancery court, which venue would be best for that particular case. The right to a particular venue can be surrendered. In criminal cases, venue is frequently changed by the court to try to give the defendant a fair trial. So uh, we do see change of venue come up when a highly publicized uh, criminal case uh, is about to go to trial. Oftentimes the defendant will ask for that change of venue uh, to try to move the case somewhere where hopefully the jury pool hasn't been impacted by the media's coverage of that particular case. 2-3A talks about the classification of courts, uh, starting with federal courts. Uh, there, there are several different types of federal courts, special federal courts, federal district courts, which would be the uh, state's equivalent to a circuit court or a trial court, federal courts of appeal, and then the United States Supreme Court. Uh, if you look at 2-3A, it gives a chart of the federal court system. At the top, we would have the United States Supreme Court. That is the highest court in the land. Uh, it, any decision made by the U.S. Supreme Court is binding on all lower courts, both federal and state. Uh, beneath the United States Supreme Court is the United States Court of Appeals, and then uh, beneath that would be special federal courts, and then federal district courts or the trial courts. Uh, the classification of courts in the state system, uh, I would not 
encourage you to refer to uh, a justice court or a city court uh, this way, but our textbook defines them as inferior courts. Uh, we have courts of original jurisdiction, appellate courts, and special courts. The state system is, is going to, in a lot of ways, uh, copy the, the structure of the federal court system. So we have the state Supreme Court, the state Court of Appeals, then the state courts of original jurisdiction, then inferior courts, that would be your uh, city courts, so the city court of Hattiesburg, for example, and then small claims courts, that's going to be primarily your justice court. Uh, that's where all small claims are handled, uh, is in your justice court. So your justice court is going to hear small civil claims where the amount in dispute is, I think, less than $10,000. Uh, but also any, any crime that occurs in the county, uh, specifically misdemeanor uh, and traffic violations, those criminal cases are going to be also handled in justice court. 2-4 defines the officers of a court. Uh, we have a judge, the bailiff. Uh, in federal court, you'll have a marshal who's assigned to the court. The clerk of court uh, is the records keeper. Uh, the clerk, the circuit clerk, the chancery clerk, county clerk, they maintain all the uh, documents that are filed in any and every case. And then, of course, the attorneys who bring the various uh, cases to court. So, uh, what is the procedure for filing a suit in a civil action? Uh, if we look at 2-5A, it gives us the procedure uh, for filing a, a lawsuit. So, you would uh, start off by filing that lawsuit, uh, also referred to as a complaint. When you go to file a complaint, uh, you have to fill out a civil complaint form. There's a filing fee. Uh, and then uh, you file your complaint with the court. They, they will file stamp it. And then you serve copies of that complaint to the defendants. Uh, when you uh, file that lawsuit and serve it, uh, that's going to be the notice of suit. Uh, also referred to as a summons or a process. Some of you may have heard of, of a process server. Uh, that's their, their job is to uh, go serve primarily civil cases uh, onto to defendants. Once the defendant has been served a copy of the complaint, they have 30 days to file a response, also known as filing the answer. Uh, once the answer is filed, then uh, there's a discovery process. And discovery can take quite a long time in a civil case. Uh, I'm talking years in complex civil litigation. Uh, it starts off with interrogatories, uh, questions, requests for admissions, uh, requests for discovery of documents, uh, and uh, other fact-finding type documentation uh, and that process of trying to obtain documentation, obtain answer to questions, interrogatories, uh, and, and then taking depositions is a very, very time-consuming and expensive process uh, that you have to go through uh, when filing a civil lawsuit. So uh, 2-5A gives us a flow chart of how that lawsuit uh, moves through the system. Again, we file the suit. Uh, you'll have a process server serve that suit on the defendants. Uh, the defendant's always going to deny all the allegations in the complaint when they file their answer. Then you have the discovery process, that's interrogatories, requests for documents, requests for admissions, uh, and depositions. And once all of that is done, then if you haven't gotten the case resolved, you'll go to trial. 
So 2-5B explains the trial procedure. So first, uh, the clerk's office will send out a jury summons uh, asking a bunch of people to show up for jury duty. And uh, that, that's what we refer to as the panel. Uh, and so everybody's brought in, they're sworn in, and then the attorneys and the judge uh, go through a process referred to as void dire. And that's where, uh, it's the only time we actually get to interact with the jury, get to ask them questions, and they respond to our answers. And the purpose of void dire is to try to pick the best jury, the best 12 people to hear your case. So once we go through the void dire process, the jury is selected and sworn in, then uh, both sides make opening statements. Uh, the plaintiff or the prosecutor, depending on if it's a civil or criminal case, always uh, begins opening. And they always go first because the plaintiff or the prosecutor has the burden of proof, followed by the defense attorney. Then the plaintiff or prosecutor puts on its case uh, through testimony by witnesses, uh, by evidence, and then if the plaintiff or the prosecutor has provided sufficient evidence uh, so the case is not dismissed by a directed verdict, then the defendant can put on its case. Uh, after the defense has put on its case, then both sides do closing arguments and the case goes to the jury. Uh, the judge will instruct the jury, uh, that's uh, the reading of jury instructions. Uh, and in those jury instructions, the judge is, is telling the jury uh, what the law is and how the law is to be applied to that particular case in determining whether or not uh, the defendant was negligent or at fault or guilty or not guilty. Then once the jury adjourns, to reach a verdict, that's the, the deliberation process. Uh, if a jury cannot reach a verdict, then the case will end in a mistrial. And that means you get to do it all over again. So 2-5B gives us a flow chart of the trial procedure. Uh, the only thing it leaves out is that void dire process. Uh, so we go jury selection, then, which is the void dire process, opening statements, then the plaintiff's case, defendant can put on its case, doesn't have to, but it can, and then closing arguments, and then uh, jury instructions, and then the jury returns a verdict. Now, in a criminal case, if the defendant is found guilty, uh, that defendant automatically has the right to appeal and their case will be appealed uh, to the higher courts, either the Mississippi Court of Appeals or the Mississippi Supreme Court. In federal court, it would go to the uh, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, Mississippi is in the Fifth Circuit. In a civil case, if either side uh, is not happy with the outcome, either side can file an appeal. Uh, to the same appellate courts. App appellate courts usually uh, only accept the transcripts of the trial and evidence admitted at the trial. So that's one reason why trial lawyers uh, can sometimes seem like they just go on and on and on uh, even when they've, to most people, have already made their point. One reason they do that is because they know that the appellate court is only going to look at the trial transcript in making this decision. So if, it, if it's not in the transcript, the appellate courts aren't going to consider it. So as a rule of thumb, uh, as a trial lawyer, uh, if when in doubt, you object. Because if you fail to object, 
then as far as the appellate courts are concerned that particular issue is waived and it comes in the appellate courts can agree with the lower court and affirm the decision made there or they can disagree if they disagree they can reverse and render which means they just reverse the lower courts decision and found for the other party normally what the low the appellate court does is reverse and remand so they reverse the decision and they send it back to the lower court to fix whatever problems that they see with the case now in small claims court this is two dash six it's a much uh less formal process uh justice court is our small claims court but also in city court uh that is not a court of record so there's no court reporter there there's no transcript being made of the uh proceedings so if you go to one of those courts it's on you to record the proceedings if you feel like you're going to maybe appeal it to a higher court there's no jury only a judge and in small claims court they really don't want lawyers in there at all they really want the individuals to represent themselves and that court is set up so you don't have to have any legal expertise you can just go in pay your filing fee fill out the form complaint the constable will serve that complaint for you and then you'll get a court date to show up to court and you'll make your arguments yourself to the judge if you're not happy with the outcome of your small claim you can appeal that appeals from municipal court or justice court are heard by either the county court so the county court of forest county would hear all appeals if you live in a county that does not have a county court then the circuit court would hear that appeal okay that gets us through chapter two we'll move on to chapter three which talks about business torts and crimes so if we look at three dash one in your textbook a tort is a private civil wrong or injury by a tort visa for which the law provides damages damages being some type of monetary award if you can prove the defendant caused the damages and they they breached the duty when they when they cause those damages a tort may be intentional or more often than not it's unintentional meaning it's the result of negligence negligence defined is the failure to exercise reasonable care three dash one a defines intentional torts to recover for an intentional tort the injured person must show three things they must show an act by the defendant an intention to cause the consequences of the act and then causation in other words the injury was caused by the defendant's act or something set in motion by that act the most common intentional tort would be an assault so you get punched in the nose and because of that intentional act you suffer physical injuries that require medical attention that's going to cost you money to pay the medical bills so an assault would have a criminal charge but also a civil tort action could be attached to it and it would be an intentional tort three one a talks about intentional torts and gives a couple of examples we've already talked about assault battery is really just a component of assault 
Assault is intentionally putting someone in fear of bodily injury, whereas battery is the actual physical conduct, uh, such as punching somebody with a closed fist. Trespass, that's going onto someone's property without permission and false imprisonment. Now the more common type of tort that makes up most of uh, civil litigation uh, are torts that result from negligence. This is discussed in 3-1b. To recover for a negligence tort, the injured party must show all these elements. Uh, must show that the defendant had a duty, that that duty was breached, and then again we get into causation that the breach was the cause of the injury and that the breach did result in actual damages. So if any of those elements are missing, you're not going to have uh, sufficient grounds to file a claim. In civil litigation, one thing we, we learn quickly about is proximate cause. So we have to show not only that the defendant had a duty and breached that duty, but that it was foreseeable uh, that any reasonable person could foresee that an injury would result from the breach of that duty. Negligence on the part of the injured party. So if the plaintiff somehow contributed to the injury, that's referred to as contributory negligence. If you live in a state that follows the doctrine of contributory negligence, uh, you're really out of luck because uh, in, in a state that follows contributory negligence, if the defendant can show that the plaintiff in any way uh, caused in some way the injury, it's a complete bar of recovery. Uh, and because that's such a, a lopsided defense, most states have abandoned contributory negligence. Now, uh, most states follow the comparative negligence doctrine, and that's where, if, let's say, the plaintiff is 50% at fault for the injuries, then their, their uh, damages would be reduced by 50%. 3.1c discusses business torts. Uh, a very common type of business tort is a product liability claim. Uh, this is a claim that's filed against manufacturers, dealers, suppliers, rental companies, where they all can be sued based on negligence or strict liability. In a product's liability claim, it would be unfair to the plaintiff if the plaintiff had to figure out which business entity in the manufacturing chain was responsible for the defective part or the defective design. So product liability says that everybody in that manufacturing chain, from, uh, from the manufacturer to the dealers to the suppliers, everybody who is part of the chain that brings that product to market is going to be equally liable for that end product if that end product hurts somebody. Uh, manufacturers and suppliers are liable for use or condition of the product, design defect, or failure to warn. So it's not enough uh, to make a, a good product uh, that's safe uh, it, it needs to also have the proper warning labels on it. Uh, if, if it does not, then that could give rise to a lawsuit, product liability suit. Strict liability, any business in the product chain, so the manufacturer, the wholesaler, all the way to the retailer, can be liable even if they were without fault if the product is dangerous to the consumer. 
three one d discusses interference with a contract or economic advantage this occurs when a business relationship has been formed and a third party so somebody outside of that business relationship causes a breach of the business relationship 3-1-E talks about confusion about a product. So there may be injurious falsehood, also called commercial disparagement or trade libel. And this is again where you've got a third party that is uh, disparaging a product or making up lies about a product in an attempt to discourage consumers from, from buying that product in the hopes that it will push that same consumer uh, to their market. And a lawsuit can arise from that. One way to avoid confusion about a product, if we look at 3-1E, would be trademarks. A trademark uh, can be words, symbols, or devices that are used to distinguish one's goods from another's. Uh, a trademark has to be uh, registered and uh, renewed on, on a uh, regular basis. Uh, if not, it will expire. Uh, it has to be distinctive, so it uh, differentiates it from others. Think about the Nike Swoop, uh, the Coca-Cola, uh, distinctive cursive writing Coca-Cola uses. Uh, when we're talking about 3-1E, uh, trademark infringement, what you're looking for are similarity of the marks, similarity of the products, similarity of marketing and customers, similarity and amount of advertising, area of overlapping use, intent of the parties in adopting the marks, strength of the marks, and actual confusion by the public. So to give you a quick example, uh, the University of Southern Mississippi, uh, one of its notable alumni is a uh, agency that makes trademarks and uh, the agency is owned by a Southern Miss alum who designed the uh, logo for the uh, Houston Texans, uh, the logo on their helmets, uh, the uh, New Orleans Pelicans, the basketball team, so, uh, you know, a very, very accomplished uh, graphic designer, and he designed the new Southern Miss Eagle Head logo several years ago. Well, uh, Iowa State filed a uh, trademark infringement suit saying that our new Eagle Head uh, was substantially similar to the uh, Hawkeye and they took us to court and they won uh, and the courts found that the uh, similarity of the marks of the product the the customers meaning the the fans of the various football teams the student body the alums um, that it, it there was too much interference and so southern miss had to uh, design a new uh, Eagle Head logo which just got adopted last year. 3-1E uh, discusses trademark dilution which is lessening of the capacity of a famous mark to identify and distinguish goods or service. Uh, 3-2A discusses different types of business crimes, uh, theft, uh, shoplifting, embezzlement, and larceny. Those are all uh, types of crimes that can really hurt a business. Uh, businesses normally refer to 
these types of crimes as shrinkage. Uh, th and this is essentially crimes that are uh, perpetrated by employees. And in the real retail market, it is a real problem. RICO uh, isn't just for organized crime. Uh, it can also be used uh, against businesses who uh, are engaged in some type of racketeering type commerce. And then computer crimes, uh, it, so that's essentially any crime committed with the aid of a computer. Uh, computer crimes can be the object of the crime, so someone's literally just stealing the computer, or uh, it's the method of committing the crime, so uh, hacking into customer accounts, hacking into bank accounts, ha uh, hacking into uh, privileged uh, trade secrets or, or other company information, all of that could, could rise to the level of a business crime. Other types of business crime, uh, this is in 3-2-A, uh, you can have a trespass, which would be an unauthorized use of or access to a computer, can involve hackers, rogue programmers, uh, placing a virus, such as a Trojan horse, on someone's computer. And you can also have criminal copyright infringement. We usually see this type of thing come up where we have uh, counterfeit or forged goods. Um, think about movies, somebody who's uh, copying movies either right out of the theater or they figured out a way to download movies online. Uh, that, that's, that's a crime. Um, and uh, they're both state and federal laws, but the, the federal government is, is pretty active in uh, investigating and prosecuting people who commit uh, criminal copyright infringement. Uh, normally what you're looking for is an infringement that was willful and done for financial gain. There is in 3.2a discussion of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. This applies to any U.S. person or business who bribes a foreign official or a foreign business who acts in furtherance of such bribe. Okay, so that gets us through chapter 3. Uh, if you have listened to this lecture, uh, I want you to email me and tell me that the, uh, the color for this particular lecture is green. So I need everybody to send me an email saying that they have listened to this lecture and that the color for this lecture is green, that way I know you listen to it. And I will see you on Thursday. Please email me with any questions. This session is no longer being recorded.